And my talk today is about uh, homogenization of Stiklov sieve problem. The results, were, part of the results were obtained in collaboration with Yusef Amira uh, from Clermont Ferrand in France and from Grigory Chechkin. I think you, all of you here, know this name. He's from Moscow. So we consider a domain which is the, the uh, uh, usual bounded smooth enough domain. We can uh, reduce a bit smoothness assumption, but it's not my aim today. We will assume that domain is smooth as we want. And we have uh, the uh, thin interface, which is perforated. So domain is connected, but it's connected uh, upper part and lower part are connected through many big collection of uh, thin cylinders. And uh, we assume that this, in the first part of the talk, of my talk, I will assume that uh, the perforation is periodic along this surface and uh, that the thickness of this interface and the diameter of uh, these cylinders are of the same order, not, not uh, exactly the same, but of the same order. We will assume that both of them are for the epsilon to power one plus delta. Of course, they should be not more than epsilon, but because the period is epsilon. So they should be for the epsilon or smaller. So we consider both cases. We consider both the case when delta is equal to zero, which means that they are of the same order as the uh, period and delta greater than zero means that they are much smaller. So just some notation. Period is epsilon, as I uh, said already. The thickness of this interface is um, of order epsilon to one plus delta. The diameter of holes, it's not necessarily uh, round. It might be any domain in the uh, cross section, there might be any domain, we will call it Y, capital. And uh, the diameter of the set is also for the epsilon to power one plus delta. And gamma plus minus epsilon is upper and lower uh, hypersurfaces which uh, bound this interface. Well, and gamma epsilon will be the surface of interior surface of cylinders. So that's, this part of the domain is very important for us because the cloth boundary condition will be imposed on this set gamma epsilon only. Lateral surfaces. L lateral surfaces of cylinders. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. In, two, in, 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 in dimension two, it will be just uh, two segments, yeah. In, in high dimension. Simon. Well, as I said already, the domain which is in the cross section of the of, of, of this cylinder, we call it Y, and we assume that it's sufficiently smooth domain. In fact, Lipschitz would be sufficient, but uh, we will assume even more. And it's to avoid the problem with the uh, uh, mutual intersection of these uh, domains and different cylinders, we assume that it belongs to the cube minus one half, one half to power d minus one. It's d minus one dimensional set. Well, then uh, the set T epsilon is the union of these cylinders in our interface. You see, we multiply it by H epsilon and uh, this Y, and we obtain a cylinder, and we make a, a, the integer shift integer in the grid with coefficient epsilon. And the set of indices here is a set of indices such that the cylinder, the whole cylinder is inside the domain to avoid some bound, b b unpleasant boundary effects, we assume that we, we uh, discard the cylinders which, are, uh, which has non-trivial intersection with the exterior boundary. So we consider only those cylinders which are completely inside the domain omega. 
Well, that's the geometry of our interface. I think it's clear. It's uh, the best way is to see this picture. And now we consider our Stiklov type problem. Pay attention to the fact that it's for Laplacian. Uh, in fact, instead of Laplacian, we could consider more, gen more, more generic operator. It's not a problem. We consider Laplacian just for presentation simplicity. And uh, we impose Dirichlet boundary condition on the exterior domain, on the exterior boundary of the domain. We impose the Neumann homogeneous condition on the upper and lower boundary of the interface. And Stiklov condition is imposed only in the interior part of the cylinder. And lambda is a spectral parameter. Any physical model for this? Ah, yeah, sure. In uh, many applications, people make, uh, well, this sieve type structure or calendar side type structure where uh, the, uh, in some electromagnetic problem or in some uh, heat conduction problem where the, the heat, heat can be, uh, in fact, uh, heat propagate only along the interface. And then the exchange, the whole exchange is through this sur uh, interior surface of this cylinder. And then uh, outside we keep the fixed temperature and the uh, upper and lower um, hyperplanes are insulated. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, in, in, fa in fact, there are many mod many mod many models which lead. Typically, it's not flat, but in fact, it's not a big problem to consider instead of uh, purely flat surface, like a bit curved. We, we can introduce curvilinear coordinates and assume the periodicity in some... So some, some, some transformation, which is just smooth diffeomorphism, would not be a problem here. Well, in particular, instead of purely periodic, we consider locally periodic structure. It doesn't make any problem. Well, for fixed epsilon, it's a problem, Siklov type problem, so well studied. We know that it's a self-adjoint problem with these boundary conditions. And we know that there is a... Um, sequence of eigenvalues which, which are real, which tends to plus infinity. The first one is simple and positive. All this, for fixed epsilon, all these facts are well known. <coughs> and I think in this audience, I should not even comment it more, more than what I said already. It's a well-known problem of uh, Siklov type problems. It doesn't matter if Siklov condition is imposed on the whole boundary or only on the part of the boundary, but this part of the boundary has a positive measure, surface measure, so everything works. We have nice spectral property for fixed epsilon of this problem. And our goal is to study the behavior of the spectrum, of the eigenpairs, bottom of the spectrum, I mean uh, the uh, J's, the pair eigenpair, J's eigenvalue and eigenfunction, as epsilon goes to zero. And uh, it's in, uh, we should expect something interesting because in the limit, the, the cylinder disappears. The limit thickness is zero. So there is, formally, there is no place to impose the boundary condition, the Stiklov type boundary condition. Where should we impose a spectral condition? Uh, in the limit when the thickness is getting just zero. So it's, the question is, how to uh, transform the spectral, uh, spectral relation in such a way that it reflects the limit behavior of these eigenpairs. So we consider, in fact, there are three different cases. Delta, we already decided that delta should be non-negative, but one case, so-called subcritical case, is the case when delta is between zero and one over d minus two. In two-dimensional case, delta may be any number. Then critical case, when delta is equal to one over d minus two, and 
Sub, uh, supercritical case, uh, delta is greater than one over d minus two. Should say that supercritical case in a sense easy. The problem is with the capacity, kind of characteristic, which is a kind of capacity. And the question is, if we consider a function which make a jump along the interface, smooth jump, which is roughly speaking equal to one on one side of the interface and zero on the other side of the interface. Um, in, if we write down the variational formulation, how much should we pay for this? And in this case, it turns out that we pay almost nothing. The cylinders are too small. So in the limit, we have something like uh, the um, uh, localized in the vicinity of just finite number, or some number of holes in the, in the vicinity of this interface, uh, infinitely many almost eigenfunctions. So in the limit, somehow we have uh, the um, eigenvalue at zero of infinite multiplicity, which is not interesting for us. It's not our aim. So we will study the case when delta is in subcritical zone between zero uh, and uh, one over d minus two. In this case, we will have non, some non-trivial behavior. Critical case is interesting, but I'm not going to discuss it today because in the critical case, there is some non-trivial intersection. Well, that's I already explained. And uh, now some previous works in this topic. The first, for the first time in just domain perforated everywhere with periodic perforation, the Stiklov spectral problem was studied by Vani, Vani Natan in uh, 81, 1981, and he proved that in the limit we have uh, classic, <coughs> classical uh, spectral problem just for uh, elliptic operator. So the spectral parameter uh, jumps from the boundary condition to the operator in the domain. Then there were works for, not for spectral problem, but for sieve uh, type inference of inf infinitely thin structure, zero, zero thickness, or some positive uh, thickness. And this work were in uh, 80s, it was Dam, uh, works by Dam Lamian, by uh, Francois Murat. Then there was works uh, for interface of positive uh, thickness. It's uh, Carlos Conca, Everis Sanchez Palencia, Atos Picard, uh, Del Vecchio. In fact, many people, I don't have time here to discuss what, what, what they did. There is a uh, huge literature devoted to this topic, but uh, mostly it's uh, the effective interface condition when we impose uh, Neumann condition or partly Dirichlet, partly Neumann condition, or if in the thin interface we have the uh, diffusion coefficient which are high contrast comparing to the exterior coefficient. So for instance, if inside the interface the diffusion is very slow or very high, then we have non-trivial interface condition in, in the limit. This kind of results were, uh, this kind of phenomena was st f were studied by many uh, mathematicians in France, in Russia, uh, and uh, I uh, also mentioned here many other contributors, among them are Maria Evgenia Peretz, Miguel Voba, Olga Alenik, Tatiana Shaposhnikova, Taras Melnik, Doina Cheranescu, Denis Borisov, who is here, Yuri Halavati, and, and in fact other people. I was not able to mention all the names. There were really many contributors. So, <coughs> but uh, nobody so far studied this uh, Stiklov problem with Stiklov condition imposed on the surface, interface surface. Well, in, in order to study this problem, we introduce the, 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 the standard spaces. The first spaces, uh, space is the space of functions which are from H1. 
H and which are equal to zero at the, bound, at the exterior boundary because we imposed homogeneous Dirichlet boundary condition at the exterior boundary. Uh, then we introduce this in the product, which is equivalent, uniformly in epsilon equivalent to the uh, standard H1 norm, H1 uh, in the product. It's written here. It's not written, but it's the, 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 the equivalence is uniform in epsilon. It's easy to check just by trace theorem and extension theorem. Well, then we write down the weak form or integral form of uh, the spectral properties. We r write what it means that function u from uh, the space v epsilon is uh, the eigen function with uh, eigen uh, value lambda epsilon of the Siklov spectral problem. So you see here we integrate over gamma epsilon only over the surface. Here we integrate over the whole domain. That's the usual uh, relation for the Siklov type problem. Well, and uh, it's well known that this, this problem can also be formulated in terms of uh, Dirichlet to Neumann uh, mapping. We consider this uh, Neumann Dirichlet type problem here. Now, now you, you see instead of um, Stiklov condition, we impose just Dirichlet condition on this interface. And then we, given a solution, we compute its normal derivative on gamma epsilon. It gives us Dirichlet to Neumann map. This map is also very well studied. We know that it's has it's a self-adjoint problem. The operator is positive definite. It uh, has a nice spectrum, which is written here also. Uh, the first eigenvalue is positive and simple. Otherwise, uh, other eigenvalues uh, is a growing sequence tending to infinity. And what is important for us that this spectrum of this problem coincide with the spectrum of the Stiklov problem. All these facts are well known. Well, it's also well known in the uh, fact that the function which normalized is, is, is in this way also form orthonormal basis not only on the surface, but under this normalization, they for, uh, form orthonormal basis in L2 of the, of the, of the whole domain. And vice versa, if we have the uh, eigenvalue in the whole domain, if the trace is under the opposite normalization, will be orthonormal basis on the surface. Well, there is a variational principle which says that the, uh, if we introduce this uh, relay uh, quotient, then uh, the first eigenvalue can be obtained as the minimum of uh, this expression over the whole space. Minimum is attained, it's, it's known. And otherwise, uh, other eigenvalue obtained as the minimum of, of the same quotient under the some orthogonality condition. Well, so we need some normalization condition. We know that for each epsilon, we have the sequence of eigenvalues of eigenpairs. We need some normalization condition. We will use this one. And in order to compare the limit uh, function and the original function, we want them to define on the same set. But omega epsilon doesn't coincide with omega. We have the limit function defined uh, in the whole domain. So we extend, we will do it as, as long as we deal with L2 theory. We extend this function uh, uh, to the whole omega just by zero. In fact, uh, if we, when we think about the estimate, we should extend in more clever way. But as long as we're uh, interested in the convergence only, we just uh, extend by zero. And we denote this function by u tilde, just to emphasize that this function are now defined in the whole domain. Well, now it's time to write down the limit problem. 
How does it look like? You see the same operator in upper part of the domain and the uh, lower part of the domain. Uh, the same Dirichlet condition at the exterior boundary. Then the jump of our function on the interface is equal to zero, so function is continuous. But the normal derivative from upper part and from lower part, it's not continuous anymore, it has a jump, and new spectral uh, relation is here. So the jump of normal derivative on the interface is proportional to function itself with, uh, okay, there is some coefficient k which is here, and with the spectral parameter lambda j. So we obtain this sp uh, new spectral problem, which is not of Stiklov type anymore. This, uh, in this uh, spectral problem, on the interface gamma, which is just the hypersur uh, hypersurface xd is equal to zero, we have uh, spectral uh, relation for the normal derivative. The normal derivative is proportional, the jump of normal derivative is proportional to the function on the interface, and the proportionality coefficient is lambda j. Now we should ask ourselves, is this problem is, yeah, k, k is just, in fact, if you think about it, it's just the uh, relative surface measure of our interface. If we compute the total uh, volume uh, surface measure of, interfa of uh, perforation in the unit uh, d minus one dimensional cube and divide, uh, 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 then it will be exactly and divide by the volume of cube in this by case by one, you will obtain this coefficient k in the limit. So it's relative volume uh, volume, volume, vol uh, sur sur surface volume. Well, uh, now we should ask ourselves, is this problem is well posed? Yeah, we can show, and it's not a big deal in fact, to, I, I'm going to explain it on the next slide, to show that this problem is self-adjoint, it's well posed, its operator is positive definite, and uh, its spectrum has the same structure. It doesn't depend on epsilon anymore. Uh, all the eigenvalues are positive. The first one is simple, and they, to, they tend to plus infinity as j goes to infinity. So that's how I candidate to be the limit spectral problem. Now uh, I'm going to explain why uh, this problem is well posed and why the spectrum is of this type. It's very easy. We consider two uh, Dirichlet problem in upper part and lower part. For each of them, we consider Dirichlet to Neumann operator on the surface. But pay attention to the fact that the normal derivative is, in one case it goes down, in other case it goes up. So if we take the sum of these two operators, it will be exactly uh, our operator read, uh, written here. And uh, the sum of two positive operators with the same, do same domain, we, we, we can easily prove that it's everything is well defined, it's self-adjoint, it's positive definite, and we have this property. So that's the idea of the proof. The proof is very simple. But that's the only proof I'm going to give because other, other proofs are very, very technical. So now we, we formulate our first theorem. We take the eigenpairs of the original epsilon problem, and uh, we consider separately the case delta equal to zero and delta is great, uh, greater to, uh, than zero, and less one over d, d minus two. So if delta is equal to zero, then the eigenvalues lambda epsilon j converge to the limit eigenvalue lambda j. It's just convergence of the spectrum, and here, there is nothing to discuss, it's, 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 here everything is clear. 
For eigenfunction, we should be careful with, as usually, with uh, multiple eigenfunction in the limit problem. So for simple eigenfunction, we have just convergence in L2 of Uj epsilon to Uj. Otherwise, we can formulate it in more vague form to say that for a subsequent, there is a convergence to, to the eigenfunction, which is a linear combination in the case of multiple eigenvalue, which is a convex linear combination of uh, eigen, eigenfunction from the corresponding eigenspace. But in fact, we can, can formulate it in more uh, accurate form. Namely, if lambda j is an eigenvalue of multiplicity m, which means that lambda j, lambda j plus 1, up to lambda j plus m minus 1 are equal to each other, then uh, there is a unitary uh, orthogonal matrix u epsilon j, which depends on epsilon, but it, 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 it's a unitary matrix, such that the uh, epsilon, the um, set of eigenfunction with index epsilon is obtained from the limit eigenfunction by applying this matrix. But this matrix de depends on epsilon. It might so the, 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 the we cannot control the <laughs> control the rotation of this. But as a, the, that's the way to express that eigenspaces uh, 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 epsilon eigenspaces can watch to the limit eigenspaces. Well, and now for the case, he, here you see we, can, we have convergence without any normalization condition because in this case, the uh, n minus one dimensional volume of uh, n minus one dimensional volume of cylinders is of order one. But if, it, if delta is greater than zero, then this va vanishing, and of course we need some compensation for this. Because in this case, uh, eigenvalues, of course, will tend to infinity, even the first one. So we should renormalize them in order to have the convergence. And this theorem explains how we should renormalize these eigenvalues. So we introduce new sequence, which the original eigenvalues multiplied by epsilon to power d minus 1 times delta. That's the right. You can easily check. It's just a question of how the uh, volume of surface volume of this cylinders beha beha behaves. Well, and then uh, we have the convergence of renormalized eigenvalues. For eigenfunction, the result is the same. Eigenfunction can watch if they simple, the corresponding eigenvalue is simple, they, then they just can watch. Otherwise, the corresponding subspaces I uh, uh, can watch and it expressed in this way again there is a unitary collection of unitary matrices such that this difference tends to zero of course it should be L2 to power m it's uh, 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 vector L2 and from this, uh, it's, it's, it follows immediately that uh, lambda j epsilon goes to infinity themselves. If we do not renormalize them, they, they quickly go to infinity. Well, now, uh, what is important in our framework? Can we uh, somehow relax our assumption? Yes, we can relax them a lot. First of all, we consider the case of fixed thickness. We can make it slowly varying depending on slow variable. Everything could be locally periodic. It's not a problem. Just in the, in, in, in the limit condition, coefficient will not be constant. They will be some nice function of x. Otherwise, we can admit that the interface is slowly changing. We can uh, assume that uh, it's not uh, uh, flat, it's a bit curved. All, 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 all this generalization are possible and can be done, in fact, in the same way. We just pass to the limit in uh, the corresponding integral identity and we do not use at all the fact that interface is flat or, okay, this condition is just for, somehow, for presentation simplicity.
what do we need? We can even assume some degeneration somewhere. We can assume that the thickness and the diameter are not of the same order. What, uh, in fact, two things are important for us. The first one is that some kind of capacity which controls the price of the jumps along the interface. This uh, capacity should not vanish as epsilon goes to zero. Because it vanishes, then we can uh, arrange eigenfunction just concentrated in the vicinity of interface. And then the picture is totally different. Then the exterior domain doesn't play any role anymore. So in order to avoid localization around interface, we should in, uh, introduce some capacity type characteristics and assume that they do not vanish. That's the first condition. And the second condition, that the scaled d minus one dimensional volume of the perforation surface should converge, not necessarily to a constant function, but to uh, some function which appear in the limit equation. These two conditions, only these two conditions are important. The rest can, can be varying as, as we want. Well, now you can uh, ask me, as usually in application, people say, okay, that's the convergence itself, but what about the rate of convergence? In our framework, we can show that uh, by a bit more accurate work with the um, uh, approximation and using Vishak Risternik lemma, we can show that, uh, in fact, the rate of convergence is at least this one. So the difference between uh, lambda epsilon j and lambda j is not greater than some constant which depends on j, of course, uh, times epsilon. Cj might explode when j times to infinity. And uh, it's for delta equal to zero. And here we have normalization. So normalized eigenvalue difference between normalized eigenvalue and the limit one also doesn't exceed an absolute value Cj times epsilon. What about eigenfunctions? Uh, NL2 of omega epsilon, even with this very, 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 very rough approximation, when I extend the fun this eigenfunction by zero, still even in this case, uh, in fact, it doesn't matter because we just forget about this part of the domain. We estimate the difference only in omega epsilon. In this case, the extension doesn't play any role. And this difference is not greater than Cj of epsilon. However, if we want to have the, them defined in the whole domain, not in only in omega epsilon, but if we want to extend them interface, there is an extension more clever than just by zero, which also, under which we also obtain this estimate. So in fact, we can extend uj epsilon in the whole domain omega in such a way that this relation uh, will hold. Well, and uh, even for these eigenspaces, we still have, under proper choice, of course, of these unitary matrices, we can uh, show that eigenspaces also can watch the rate of convergence for them <coughs> is of order epsilon. Now, uh, you can ask me, is it possible to go further and to obtain the beta approximation? And better approximation of, uh, in fact, of essential interest here because in the limit problem, we lose completely the information about the local behavior of eigenfunction in the vicinity of the interface. Because imagine we had our boundary condition de defined on this surface, and in the limit, we have totally different behavior. It's clear that in the small vicinity of the interface, this function might differ. And uh, in the limit, uh, when, when we up, uh, consider this estimate, we don't see this difference. It just shows that this difference between this function and this part, uh, it's, it's L2 norm is not greater than epsilon. But if we want to go to, to understand more, in more details, how the function behave in, uh, in uh, local coordinates here, we should consider some boundary layer characters. We can do it at once, but after that, we need ma uh, some matching with what is coming from the exterior. 
So by means of matching asymptotic expansion, we can in fact under sufficient regularity assumption, we can consider the full asymptotic expansion if um, we have nice exterior boundary condition, as usually in constructing asymptotic expansion. At the, uh, after constructing two terms, we face the problem of disagreement of periodic structure and the exterior boundary. This problem appears also here, and uh, in fact, for, gene for, the, generic, for the generic smooth domain, we cannot construct more than two terms. The third term will be of, of no interest because it will not improve the rate of convergence. But for some nice domain, like torus or exterior domain, if we consider instead of generic Dirichlet, uh, generic domain, instead of it, we consider some periodic boundary exterior condition, we can go further it and construct the full asymptotic expansion. That's uh, by matching asymptotic expansion. And the, 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 this matching is kind of non-trivial. The, the first term, which we, we will have linear boundary condition at, inf at, at infinity, and then there will be some polynomial boundary condition at infinity. So it's an it's interesting problem by itself, but okay, it's, I don't want to discuss it in more details here. At least first term will be just boundary way term. I want uh, to say some uh, words about uh, stochastic case. It's a new thing, and um, what, what we have, we have a usual standard uh, probability space. It's equipped with the ergodic dynamical system, which I call to x. x from d minus one dimensional space, because I am going to perforate only the d minus one dimensional interface. Uh, what by definition is dynamical system? It's a group of invertible tra uh, measurable transformation from g to itself. It preserves the measure. And uh, it's measurable as a map from the pair. So if we consider tau as a map from g times rd minus 1 to g, then it's measurable. And uh, in this case, we equip rd minus 1 with uh, the standard Borel sigma algebra. So in this space, we consider the product sigma algebra, product of f and Borel sigma algebra in R. And ergodicity means that any function which is invariant with respect to O T X uh, is a, a, a constant or in other set any set which is invariant has measure zero or measure one. Now we consider the so-called dispersed random structure. What is it? Uh, we say that uh, dispersed random structure is a random set so there is an element of our sigma algebra such its probability is strictly between 0 and 1. And we take the realization of characteristic function of this set M. It's written here. B of omega is such x for which T x omega belongs to M. It gives us some set in measurable set, Borel measurable set in Rd which parameterized with the parameter omega. Omega is a parameter here, and for each omega, we obtain some Borel random set, almost surely, for almost all omega, we obtain a Borel uh, set in omega. And we postulate additional property of this set. Namely, we assume that uh, for almost all omega, this set is a union of non-intersecting bounded open sets, The distance between any such uh, domains is greater than some deterministic positive constant, so they, they, they are well separated from each other. And uh, the diameter of them is also bounded by some deterministic constant, so they cannot be too large. And the last condition that they are uniformly smooth, in particular they cannot be too small. Uniform smoothness uh, assumes in particular that these sets cannot be very small. Well, so we assume that our, uh, th th these four conditions are satisfied, and there are, if you check in the literature on stochastic geometry, there are many nice examples 
of this geometry. Typically, they are constructed in terms of some Bernoulli percolation models, in terms of some uh, Poisson random process. There are many others. I just, uh, I didn't want to spend time with uh, introducing particular models, but believe me, that there, that there are many natural, widely used by physicists. Well, then we take, we rescale this set with the uh, parameter one of epsilon. We multiply this b, uh, set by epsilon. And uh, we consider the collection of cylinders such that in the cross-section we have this domain random, that's yj, and in vertical direction it's again uh, epsilon h. Here, for simplicity, I consider only the case delta is equal to zero. Delta greater than zero can be considered in the same way, but it will be more visible if I consider only one case. And uh, again, we consider only those cylinders which are completely inside the domain omega. So we consider the same Stiklov problem, but now the geometry is random. It's the, the location, the, the shape of the domain, everything change one f from one position to another. The only thing we have, we have er stationarity and ergodicity. Well, again, for fixed epsilon, still we have the same property, nothing changed. Since we have very nice geometry, you remember that it's a collection of smooth domains. Uh, the question about li the limit behavior, and it turns out that the limit spectral problem has the same problem. It is deterministic now. Pay attention that here, it's not written explicitly, but here everything depends on the realization. For each omega, we change omega, we change the boundary value problem. Because <coughs> this domain, gamma epsilon omega, they do depend on omega. But in the limit problem, all the constants are deterministic. And now the question, what is this k? The key question here, how to compute this k? And it turned out that this k should be computed in the following way. We take the uh, unit cube, we take the intersection with our structure, and we can compute only surface me 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 measure of these inclusions. Since they are smooth, surface measure of the part which is inside this cube is well defined. And we take the expectation. After that, we multiply by h, of course, by the length of the cylinder. Of course, since we, we, we took the expectation, it's a deterministic constant. And it turned out that this constant appears in the limit problem. That's the limit characteristics. As usually in homogenization theory, if random geometry is in the principal term of operator, then it, the geometry itself affects the structure of the limit coefficients if it's in, low, in the low order terms. And this, in this case, the Stiklov condition is a kind of low order terms. Then uh, it's just expectation. The mutual geometry of this set. So if, if we shift them, keeping just the proportion, this coefficient will not change. And it's very typical in homogenization theory. The uh, limit problem see, see, does see geometry only if the uh, geometry is involved in the principal term, in the high, high, highest order term of the operator. Even in the periodic case, right? Hmm? Even, in the periodic Even in the periodic case. case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we, for instance, take a bigger period and uh, in, in, in this period shift a bit, then the, the principal coefficient will change, low order terms will not change, right. Well, and then theorem is basically the same <coughs> as in the deterministic, in the periodic case. We have the convergence of the spectrum, lambda j converges for each j. The uh, eigenfunctions which corresponds to the simple eigenvalue of the limit problem converges in L2 and uh, here we have convergence of subspaces. I, I explained this already, I think it's clear. But in general 
for generic random media, no way to have the rate of convergence because this ergodicity is uh, not a quantitative property, it's a qualitative property. So Bergov theorem only states the convergence. It never gives us the rate of convergence. But then we can uh, ask ourselves what happened if we have better mixing condition, not just ergodicity, but some mixing. That is very interesting, challenging problem. Uh, how to recalculate the uh, rate of convergence for the spectrum in terms of uh, some decay of some mixing coefficient, strong mixing or maximal correlation. It's an open, nice open problem. <coughs>